Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Brian Gruneau. <clears throat> Brian's an emergency physician at St. Paul's, a scientist at the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences, CHAOS, and an investigator at the BC site of Canadian Resuscitation Outcome Consortiums, a clinical trial network for the study of out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. He's developed the regional protocols for cardiac arrest management, and I'm very proud to say that he has pioneered the first ED-based ECMO program in Canada uh, out of St. Paul's. Um, Brian hates it when I tease him about how young he is, so I'm not going to do that, but I would encourage you later at the bar to consider pickpocketing his wallet and watch as he gets kicked out for being underaged. Um, Brian's going to talk to us tonight about uh, cardiac resuscitation update. Thanks, Dan. There's always a Doogie Howser joke in there somewhere. I don't think I'll ever be able to avoid that. So as Dan mentioned, my name is uh, Brian Gruno, and today I'm going to be talking to you about what I'm sure you've all been waiting for, which is a quick, uh, quick fire resuscitation review for 2016 to 17. What's in and what's out? So although you may think we just do the same boring old stuff that we've been doing since the invention of external cardiac massage, it actually is a quite uh, dynamic field. On that note, we might be even bringing back uh, the old treatment of tobacco smoke enemas for resuscitation. Uh, and I'm looking for some volunteers afterwards to participate in a study where you'll be performing this procedure. So please talk to me afterwards. So in just terms of disclosures, I do receive uh, funding, research funding from UBC and Providence Healthcare, and I do have on loan some Lucas devices from PhysioControl for a, a, a study that we're doing. So first, let's talk about mechanical CPR devices. In? Now we're going to need some voting here. Let's see some hands. Who thinks mechanical CPR devices are a good plan? In? Okay. Or out? There's a few. So these have been in development for a few decades now. First with the thumper device, as you can see there. Uh, next we had the autopulse, uh, and then the Lucas device. Here we go. So the rationale for these devices was simple. We had good data indicating that high quality CPR was associated with better outcomes. We knew that. So logically, we'd think providing good CPR would be, lead to better outcomes. We were very excited about these devices, as my three-year-old you can see there. They achieved AHA recommended CPR targets without fail, and this is something that a human simply cannot achieve. However, to our surprise, unfortunately, the first great test of these devices uh, resulted in a fail, showing worse neurological outcomes to hospital discharge. People thought that maybe it was due to the time to apply these devices that was the problem. We then had a few trials looking at the Lucas device, which people thought was faster to apply. First the LINK trial, and then the paramedic trial here, which was done in the UK, pragmatic randomized trial of 3,000 out-of-hospital arrests. You can see that the Lucas group actually fared slightly worse than the human-performed CPR group. So several RCTs looking at mechanical CPR devices were, comp were compiled in this meta-analysis. You can see the Lucas device, uh, sorry, the autopulse at the top and the Lucas device at the bottom. And overall, you can see that the system-wide application of these mechanical CPR devices for out-of-hospital arrest did not lead to improved outcomes. And it actually looks like the m manual performed CPR is better. So it just barely crosses one, uh, showing no statistical significance. Well, it looks like the application of these devices system-wide is not warranted. They may have use in special circumstances, the prime target being transport to hospital with ongoing CPR. This study, you can see, found that extrication of patients from, from the scene of a cardiac arrest resulted in a cumulative four minutes of time without CPR. Here's another study which showed that manual CPR was significantly impaired during extrication and transport of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest victim while the mechanical CPR device was unaffected, 20% of the time without CPR uh, was what they measured in the manual CPR group with, ex with extrication. So mechanical CPR devices, should we use them for all out-of-hospital cardiac arrests? Unfortunately, this isn't the smoking gun that we were hoping for. For those transferred to hospital, however, they may have a benefit. However, we need much more research to determine if and when there actually is any benefit of transport to hospital of those in refractory cardiac arrest. And if so, we need studies comparing the outcomes of manual versus mechanical CPR strategies. 
So the next topic isn't so much related to resuscitation, but it's actually been a, a very important topic to some of the uh, folks in our group. I was uh, requested by a number of people for me to look into this for what's in and what's out 2017. So this is the topic of clear heels. So let's see a show of hands. In? <laughs> Kenny? Out. Hmm. Well. So interestingly, searches to buy clear heeled shoes on the internet increased by over 2,000% from 2015 to 2016, making it one of the most popular fashion trends of this year. And I know you've been getting strange looks from your friends, Aaron. But if you're wearing clear heels right now, you're rocking it. So if you feel the need to leave this talk right now to go buy some clear heel shoes before Buffalo Bills tonight, I'll understand. You can take off. I know Aaron already has some. So the next topic, prolonged attempts at resuscitation, in or out. And it's often hard to know how long we should continue CPR before calling it quits. So in this study, we tried to decide if there was a time that we could, quote unquote, safely terminate resuscitation in those who hadn't achieved ROSC. We looked at 1,600 consecutive out-of-hospital cardiac arrests from the greater Vancouver area, of whom about half achieved ROSC and 14% survived to discharge. So this graph here, I'm going to take you through it. It demonstrates the probability of a good neurological outcome at hospital discharge among those who remain in refractory arrest at increasing durations of CPR. The middle line is the full cohort of patients, and the other lines are divided by initial shockable rhythm. Shockable or non-shockable. So you can see for an example, at 15 minutes, there were over 1,200 patients who were still pulseless, of whom 3% would later achieve a pulse and have a good neurological outcome. You can see that for those who had initial shockable rhythms, they demonstrated much better resilience for prolonged periods of CPR in comparison to their non-shockable counterparts. We often consider a therapy that yields less than 1% success as not worth doing. If you apply this concept, the time at which uh, the likelihood of survival of a good outcome among these groups declined to below 1% is 34 minutes overall, uh, 48 minutes in the shockable group, uh, and 15 minutes in the patients with initial non-shockable rhythms. So we ran this same concept in a multi-center cohort of over 11,000 cardiac arrests over North America over a two-year period. And you can see it from the different graphs there, the initial shockable rhythm is not the only factor uh, which affects resilience with prolonged failed resuscitative efforts, uh, allowing for a possible good outcome still. Witness arrest, bystander CPR also played large roles. So prolonged attempts at resuscitation, I think that the most reasonable thing to do is uh, ensure that you're providing at least 30 minutes of resuscitation for, for any patient, regardless of their characteristics. And then those with shockable initial rhythms or with other favorable prognostic features, I'd consider efforts to out to 45 uh, or 60 minutes, depending on the characteristics. So number four, the universal TOR rule. Who uses this rule? Bueller? Who doesn't use it? Who's never heard of it? Who doesn't care? So this rule was, guide to, was developed to guide termination of resuscitative efforts uh, for out-of-hospital arrests, and it probably has some validity for in-hospital arrests as well. The rule states that if the arrest is not witnessed by paramedics, if there's no ROSC uh, or no shocks delivered within three cycles of CPR and rhythm analysis, then termination of efforts is appropriate. Otherwise, the rule recommends continuation of therapy. In our BC system, in the pre-hospital system, there are few patients who are transported to hospital with ongoing CPR, but we were very curious to determine whether termination after only three cycles of CPR was appropriate or whether it was too early. So we applied this universal toll rule to over 7,500 consecutive cardiac arrests in BC over a four-year period and found that there was 4,000 patients for whom the universal toll rule recommended termination after three cycles. You can see that among these patients, a third achieved ROSC uh, and 2.1 survived to hospital discharge, the majority of whom had good neurological outcomes. These results seemed a bit too good to be reasonable for termination. So we looked at what the rule would look like if it was applied at later durations into the resuscitation. And this graph shows the proportion of survivors among those for whom the universal tour rule recommended termination, uh, with 95% confidence intervals for the geeks out there like Rob. Nothing? 
You can see that as you apply the rule at later time points, the proportion of missed survivors decreases, and as we get out to 30 minutes, there's virtually no missed survivors. So the universal tour rule, if you've never heard of it, uh, it might be worth looking it up. Uh, if you apply it after three cycles, as currently recommended by AHA guidelines, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, but application at later time points uh, does have good performance. So number five, Stenstrom and Mangle. In or out? <laughs> So the, la the last time I talked here, I told everyone that Rob had syphilis. So I thought that we should have a, a, good, a, good, a good talk about him today. So like a fine wine, these fellas only get better with age. So cardiac ultrasound for prognostication. Who's using this? A few people. Who's not using it? Who, who's, who didn't vote? So this is the original study which initiated the practice of using cardiac ultrasound for prognostication and cardiac arrest. They looked at the number of patients who had cardiac, uh, no cardiac motion on ultrasound and then their respective outcomes. And they reported that no survivors among those who had cardiac standstill. So this brings us to the recently completed REASON study which involved a lot of Canadian sites. And I think it's important data. So they had a prospective registry of patients who came to the hospital. It was either out of hospital arrest or patients who arrested in the, in the emergency department. Uh, and these patients were limited to those who had initial non-shockable rhythms or sh non-shockable rhythms uh, upon presentation to the emergency department. And they performed bedside ultrasound for all these patients. So not surprisingly, in this study as well, cardiac motion was indeed associated with survival at hospital discharge. But the real question that would be helpful for us is does it have sufficient ability to rule out survival to justify stopping efforts? So this is somewhat complicated as you'll see. Of the 793 patients in this study, there were only 13 survivors. And this was 10 in the cardiac activity group and three in the no activity group. So if they would have used cardiac activity as a criteria for stopping efforts, they would have killed a quarter of their few survivors. The test characteristics, as you can see, of using this cardiac motion, yes or no, are also not compelling. Sensitivity, which demonstrates how many survivors had cardiac activity, was only about two-thirds. Similarly, specificity, which shows how many non-survivors had no activity, was only about two-thirds as well. So to make this a bit more clinically useful, we know in this cohort, overall survivor was only 1.6%. So that's our pretest probability. 1.6% is really bad. If you had cardiac motion, your survival probability of survival went up to 3.2%, which is still really bad. And with standstill, your likelihood of survival went down to 0.8%, which is really, really bad. So it didn't really give us that much more information in terms of our decisions to terminate efforts. So a few major issues. There was no standardized resuscitation protocol here. And this study was performed by people who believe in ultrasound. It's highly likely that decisions to, that were made to terminate care were based on the standstill findings. And if your resuscitation is terminated, your likelihood of survival is approximately zero. Secondly, in this study, 11 patients with cardiac standstill actually developed cardiac activity. So it's difficult to know whether we should base our decisions on that cardiac activity now or whether we need to wait longer to see if cardiac activity develops. Thirdly, we don't even know what cardiac standstill is, unfortunately. So this is one study that was recently released that tested physician ultrasonographers at six conferences. So these are the geekiest of geekiest physician ultrasonographers. They were shown 15 video clips and asked for the simple question, cardiac motion, yes or no? Beyond random chance, they only agreed 50% of the time. So cardiac standstill to terminate justification of efforts. This, is, this data point may be helpful in combination with the other data points you have in terms of how long they've already been uh, undergone attempted resuscitation, their baseline characteristics. But alone, it's unreliable and adds minimal information when only uses a single data point. Far side of the sky. In? <laughs> Who's read it? Everyone. We should be giving these out instead of the water bottles, I think. <laughs> He's so dreamy, eh? <laughs> so Dan actually will be holding a book signing at Buffalo Bills tonight. So 
Make sure you get there early. Uh, it's going to be a long line. In. I gave you an in. <laughs> so I couldn't resist by mentioning this little beauty. Uh, does amiodarone or lidocaine work for refractory ventricular fibrillation? That was the goal of this study that we randomized many patients in, overall 3,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests throughout North America, to give uh, an answer to this question. So here are the results. Survival to discharge uh, in those randomized to amiodarone, lidocaine, or placebo was 24% in the amiodarone group, 23.7 in the lidocaine group, and 21% in the placebo group. And I forgot to ask everyone, who, who here thinks amiodarone works? No one? One? Thanks. <laughs> lidocaine? No. Okay. Uh, who thinks it doesn't work at all? None of this stuff. It's all hogwash. Got a few voters, not many. Comparing amiodarone to, and lidocaine to placebo individually, you can see that they almost met, met statistically significance, but not quite. So on the topic of statistics, as you know, the ability to find a significant difference is highly dependent on the number of patients you have. If you have more patients, you have a higher chance of finding, uh, seeing a result between two different proportions. So these folks got greedy, and they evaluated two different drugs uh, against placebo. But let's hypothetically imagine if all the lidocaine patients had been enrolled as either amiodarone or placebo, resulting in 1,500 patients per group. We still have 24 versus 21 percent. However, now we do have a statistically significant result. And that's just a hypothetical uh, situation, because obviously that didn't happen. So let's move on to another issue here, and it's whether amiodarone works when given via IO access. Commonly, Many of you probably think, and uh, often that we're taught this, that IO access is equivalent to IV access, and maybe even equivalent to central line access. But evidence proving this is lacking. So in this ALP study, when we look at patients who are treated with IO access, survival is 19% in the amiodarone group, 20.6% in the lidocaine, and 22.5% for placebo. So it looks like placebo is actually better here in contrast to the other results. So when we look at patients who are treated with IV, though, we get a much different story. We can see that amiodarone here, 25.9, lidocaine, 24.6, placebo, 20.6. Amiodarone has by far a statistically significant benefit when uh, looking only at the IV group. So amiodarone and IV access, if you would have asked me a few months ago, I would have said for sure amiodarone uh, leads to no benefit. But I think there, based on this data, it actually is highly likely to be effective when given intravenously. However, amiodarone appears to have no effect when given intraosseously, and it looks like there's actually harm done. On this note as well, the efficacy of giving other cardiac arrest medications very, uh, via the IO route is unproven, and I would be highly cautious when using this route and assuming that to be true. Number nine, Stenstrom plus and Mango plus clear heels. You're going to have to buy them some drinks tonight to find out. Use caution. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's my email address. Feel free to email with any questions.